Welcome to the Brutkasten Talk. Today I am joined by Ryan Grant Little. He is a food and climate tech investor from Canada. Uh, he founded the nonprofit organization CanadaHelps.org when he was just a teenager. After founding one of North America's most influential renewable energy companies, he became an investor and spent some time in Berlin. Now he lives in Vienna. Welcome, Ryan. Thanks a lot, Oscar. Nice to be here. Thank you for taking the time. So first question, how is it to live in Vienna and why did you choose to come here? Well, it's not for nothing that every year Vienna wins number one quality of life in the world. And that's, I think, actually why I came here as well. I was in Berlin for 11 years and Berlin is a lot uh, that, you know, I can say positive about Berlin. But after a certain period of time, the city changed a lot and I wanted something where the quality of life was a little bit better. Um, and so... Now, I mean, where else can you be where you can go to the opera and, and 10 minutes later you can be sitting on a beach uh, along the canal. Um, it's a beautiful city. I, the people are friendly. I really like it here. That's nice. Uh, what do you think is positive about the Austrian startup scene? Uh, a number of things. So for one, I think it's still kind of a secret out there that Vienna can be a really great startup hub. Um, cities like Berlin, for example, the uh, price of and availability of apartments is getting so tight that it's hard for startups to attract people to, to live there and work there. I think Vienna, one of the ma major advantages is that housing is so great and available. Um, the city works really well. Uh, the the city hall and and the different agencies that you have to work with to come you know and and start working here that functions um in a way that it doesn't everywhere else um but i think the number one thing especially for climate tech companies or companies that might have a large kind of hardware component or a capex component is that there's a lot of funding here the aws with ffg these types of agencies are super well funded they work well um, I, and I sometimes get the sense that there's more funding available than there are opportunities for them. And that's very rare in most countries. So enough of the good talk. Um, where do you see improvements in the Austrian startup environment? Well, hmm. there could be more connection. So I, with, uh, in the food tech space, I host every quarter a food hack uh, meetup at the Impact Hub. I would really encourage people who are interested in that space to, to Google us and look us up. But I did this because my sense was compared to a city like London, a city like Berlin, a city like Toronto, where I'm from, there are a lot fewer kind of meetups. There's a lot less grabbing a glass of wine as a kind of industry group informally after work and exchanging ideas than there are in other cities. And I feel like that was a gap um, that I wanted to target, at least for the food tech space here. Okay, so let's dive into your role as an investor. Um, where do you see the most potential for alternative proteins in the food industry? People often ask, you know, so alternative proteins, we're usually talking about cultivated meat. So that's real meat, from, but from animal cells rather than animals themselves. Uh, fermentation, which is um, sort of using the same process that you use for yogurt or, or beer, um, but, uh, but to create kind of meat-like ingredients. And then plant-based, which is the one that most people are familiar with, the Beyond Burgers and stuff like that. And people often ask, which one of these is going to be the future? And the answer is all. So rather than the silver bullet, it's the silver buckshot. Um, and it's gonna, what, I, what I see as the most interesting development coming down the pike is the hybridization of this and it's happening already so what if you had a plant-based burger but with cultivated animal fat to create that kind of real fat taste you know so mixing these things together into one product is what i think kind of the biggest opportunity is and as i say it's already starting and what potential do you see from the consumer side consumers are are tricky i mean it's we saw uh a big peak in during the pandemic as people were willing to try new things. Um, that slowed down a little bit, especially as people started going back to restaurants and people went back to sort of some uh, old habits. Um, the, the most interesting thing I think about consumers and what I think more and more of our alternative proteins companies are realizing is that, as with a lot of things, you need to not look at kind of what the survey results are and look at what the buying behavior is. So if you ask people what's the most important thing for you in food, they'll say nutrition and sustainability and all these kinds of things. And then, you know, as you watch them grab a bag of Doritos from the shelf and take it to the cash. But in fact, what, what's important for people is taste, 
price and availability. And so the Good Food Institute, for example, has named these three things as this is what has to happen uh, in order for people to make the switch to this to alternative proteins. And I mean, also for myself, you know, I, I see this. I I want things to be. If if the veggie burger is twice as expensive as something else, then it's a it's a difficult decision. It's not gonna it's not gonna hit the mainstream. So those three factors, I think, are kind of the table stakes for this industry to succeed. <clears throat> Do you see the Austrian society on the right track regarding also regarding innovations in the food industry? Yes, I mean I, I think uh, recently also a Good Food Institute did a, a survey both in Germany and Austria and found a vast majority of people are agree that they should eat less meat, but you know, but not necessarily that they have to give up kind of the taste or the experience of eating meat, um, and also that they would be willing to try something like cultivated meat. So I feel like the consumer readiness is there, the adventureness, so to speak. Um, you see it also in the behavior. I mean, all you have to do is go to Billa or Spar, and you know, every few weeks there are new products on the shelves. Um, and I think and they're selling quickly, they're selling well. So this shift is happening. And the interesting thing is that the more that it happens, the more people kind of feel good about it. It's kind of when these things aren't available on the shelf that there's the biggest uh, kind of uproar about it when it's this more theoretical thing. But once people try, uh, you know, their first Beyond Burger, they're like, this isn't such a big deal. This is actually quite good, right? Yeah, but uh, we have like uh, political discussions about it. So do you see Austria endangered of falling behind of that uh, political issues? Austria is at a, at a turning point right now, or it's at a, a tipping point. So Europe is largely, I would say, moving towards supporting this industry. There's a lot of reasons for this from, you know, the sustainability, from the like environmental, but also from job creation and investment. So what you see is countries like Denmark, Netherlands, UK, um, the Basque region of Spain, actually putting together funds to support alternative proteins, whereas you have other countries like Italy under Maloney has, you know, passed a bill that um, bans cultivated meat, sale of production of all these kinds of things. And that's really t uh, tapping into like a populist uh, sentiment and exploiting it, right? And so trying to create, t tap into this ancient or this outdated idea of our food culture that, it, you know, this pastoral farm that def definitely doesn't exist anymore, right? So the farms that you see on your milk cartons are not where your milk is coming from anymore, but it's tapping into that sentiment. In Austria, there's a risk of this happening as well at, with this bill out front. And I think, you know, I would hope that the politicians um, who are putting this forward and, and who are who are fighting against it will see that what the majority of Austrians want is for the freedom and the choice to be able to look at alternatives to, you know, to meat from slaughter. Mm -hmm. And back to your role as an investor, uh, what are you looking for in startups when you want to invest? I'm a very early stage investor, and so I'm generally looking for a team that, you know, an entrepreneur that is uh, willing to uh, learn, who's tenacious, who's resilient. Um, there's this old idea from, from Harvard business, business School from like 1980 that it's better to bet on an A team with a B idea than a B team with an A idea. So. If I, if I see a really good team and I think they still have some work to do on figuring out the market exactly, that's okay with me versus a team that doesn't, you know, maybe doesn't have the drive, but has a really good idea. So in the early stages, it's largely about finding the right entrepreneurs. You speak about yourself as an impact investor. Um, how do you define impact for yourself and your investment? You know, I've been working in the impact investing space for a very long time, and especially in Germany, there's a lot of question about, well, how do you define impact investing. And there's always someone who says, you know, all investments have an impact, whether good or bad, which of course is true. Um, and the one thing I learned is that like, so I have a definition that it should be um, actively measured uh, and, it sh and it should be intentional, right? So you can't be an accidental impact investor. Um, it, so you're looking at impact that's, that's actively measured, whatever it is, whether it's CO2 or animals saved or, or you know, uh, people with 
with barriers to the employment market served and that type of thing. What I noticed, though, is that uh, because so many people come at it from different perspectives, you know, foundations might view it this way, an angel investor this way, and, and everything in between, is I like to think more about features. So an impact investment could have, you know, seven or eight different features, and some will be more important to one type of investor than another. And so that gets us around this concern about agreeing on a definition, because in my experience, it's very, very hard to agree on one definition of what impact investing is. So you don't have like one sentence as a definition? I, I mean, an investment that's actively measured, that has social uh, in, or environmental benefit um, with where the impact is intentional. Okay. Something along those lines. <laughs> All right. Um, the, in the Austrian food industry, we see a switch from companies um, having like a B2C approach going into a B2B business model. Uh, why is that in your opinion? Funding is tight worldwide right now, and especially in, in uh, alternative proteins um, since 2021 or 2022, as we're kind of in this valley. Um, B2C launches are very expensive um, to get you know, people to try new Uh, new products is usually you need a lot of marketing. You need to spend a lot of money on Instagram ads, whatever it is, right? Um, whereas B 2 B is is generally a, a bit easier because you can, you know, the margins might be lower, but you can hit uh, bigger numbers by uh, of delivery of a product, right? So um, by working with you know, hotels or food service or, or restaurants. So it's a, I think when funds are limited and, and rounds are smaller, B2B is a good way to enter. Um, and then the goal is to get things moving to B2C. I think as the funding recovers, which is happening now in second half of 2024, I think is looking very good. We'll see more B2C launches again in the space. Do you see even more potential in that direction for the food tech startup industry in Austria? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, th I don't know if it's specific or particular to Austria, but I think um, I think it's probably the case everywhere. And Austria is no different. You know, Austria is a, a great market to test things out and to use as a test bed for the broader DAC region before then going more global. So I think we see that. I mean, there's some great examples also of companies like Kern Tech, um, you know, that are doing some B2C stuff. Uh, here and are already available on with their uh, great chocolate milk from from uh, cores of fruit, which I think is is really cool. And you know, I think I can imagine that scaling pretty broadly across Europe. <clears throat> you just mentioned the lack of uh, financing. So, um, what needs to be done to take action and to like get more money flowing? I don't think anything. I don't think there's any kind of one thing that needs to be done. These things work in cycles. You know, I've been around long enough to have seen. Been in, this is the third one that I've been in. Um, so the dot com, you know, bu uh, bubble and burst. And I remember, you know, I had a, an e-commerce company company in the late 1990s, and in 2000, uh, reading all these things and hearing from people. Okay, that's it. The internet was a fad. That's the internet is over, right? We're never going to fund these kinds of things again. Um, then in 2008, the financial crisis as well. Both of these, by the way, I was raising, which was a very hard time to be raising as an entrepreneur. But 2008, and then we say, okay, I mean, this is over. The days of low interest or, you know, of, of uh, 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 big rounds and stuff like that are over. And then we see that slowly start to creep back again in 2010, 2011. And it brings us to 2021, 2022, where we see it happen again. And so these are just cycles, basically. So your advice to founders would be just to sit tight and wait? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> I would say, try, I would say um, survive, you know, uh, raise what you can, be lean, target profitability uh, sooner. Investors also don't really learn from this a lot of the time, right? So the same investors that three years ago are saying, don't worry about profitability, spend, spend, spend to get the market share and to own the market are now saying, why are you spending so much, right? Why, why, are you, uh, why is your burn so high when you're pre-revenue? I don't, you know, I don't think there's a whole lot. This is a systemic thing. This is a people issue. Um, we're in the recovery stage right now. It will, it will change. But, but for now, you know, in, for for entrepreneurs out there, it's hang on, survive. You know, a lot of a lot of companies, a lot of startups won't survive this period. Some of the better ones will, and they'll be better positioned than they were a few years ago. This is the separating of the wheat from the chaff. 
So in general, you would say there's like a need for like having like the big picture in mind for also for investors. Yeah, I mean, I you know, investors aren't always the be the best at big picture or long term thinking, right? It's kind of like what's happening right now, and you know, the long term is kind of my investment horizon and, and that type of thing. But as I say, having been you know in this cycle the other times as an entrepreneur, this time as an investor, I'm not panicked about it, right? So I mean, I have in, I have 25 investments. A lot of them are struggling to raise rounds. Some of them are squeaking through. Some of them are having a bigger bigger trouble. You know, if they can make it through, things will loosen up in the next six, 12 months. Okay, last but not least, a little bit of a wider question. We see a decline in European economic strength. What can Europe do to re-strengthen its economy and be able to compete in the global market against economic powerhouses like, for example, the US or China? So just the easy questions yeah, today. Just, just the easy <laughs> questions in life. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, I think the the biggest difference. I, I'll, I'll compare this to the North American context because that's my that's kind of where I that's come why from. I'm asking. Yeah, and so and less <laughs> less so. You know, China's a whole a whole different beast, and I'll leave that kind of question to some people who who know that stuff better. Um, <clears throat> the the I think the reason that we see some bigger plays coming from North America or some you know more aggressive in, investment is that there's a, there's a, a larger acceptance of failure, a larger risk tolerance there than there is in Europe, right? And so it's a mindset issue. Um, I saw that a lot when I was living in, in Germany, and it's kind of, um, you, you see it with investors not kind of really willing to take a risk. So th things in Europe are very comfortable, right? I mean, speaking for in the Austrian context, I mean, it's different in, in different places, but things are very comfortable. There's a very, very tight social safety net. Um, that's amazing for the day-to-day -day life. It doesn't necessarily encourage people to take big risks, right? And it, it's, um, to some extent, the do-or-die mentality for entrepreneurs isn't here because it's kind of, it can be like, well, we'll try this, I'll keep my job. If it doesn't work, um, I'll go on unemployment for 12 months and, and it will be fine. And I think that some of the investor approach here as well is a bit kind of more conservative everything's a bit you know it's 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 like the cars everything's a little bit smaller than yeah, north that's america a, uh, would you say there's a need for more state support maybe from the european union for example to compete against uh, the inflation reduction act for example oh yeah i mean i think in that respect thinking big about uh about um support for specific industries like climate tech and that that type of thing it's so much of this is driven by policy and, and by strong and, and ambitious policy. That kind of stuff is always welcome to drive an industry. So at the EU level, maybe at the country level, specifically in Austria, I think the support is quite strong. Okay, Ryan, uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, the very interesting insights. Uh, also, dear Brewcustom community, thank you so much for watching and stay tuned.